what the okay. Fresh. All right. Ready, guys? Rock and roll. Oh, wow. Yeah, Grandma in... did win it. Grandma did win it OT. Well, recording's already been in progress. So, hey, guys. <laughs> Welcome to our Mark Madness preview. This is a great setup. Um, fun fact. Uh, so, do you, what did the name Trev Alberts mean to you? Played in Nebraska, used to be on ESPN. Uh, so he ended up, he was the AD at, uh, that, at Nebraska until in 2021, and he left just about a week ago to Texas A&M. And uh, guess who Nebraska plays in the first round of the men's NCAA tournament? Texas A&M. Guess who Nebraska plays in the first round of the women's NCAA tournament? Get out. Seriously? That is correct. Uh, Both games. Wow. Literally back to back. It's something I found interesting. There's so much other stuff to talk about. I'm Steve Rubinowitz. I am Jay Kaplan. And as everybody knows, this is my favorite time of year. I cannot wait to dive into all this madness of March. I'm Anthony Trey. This is my favorite time of the year, too, to win some money off some co workers. <laughs> it's tournament back in time, baby. Hopefully it, doesn't, hopefully, it doesn't go as well as your parlays. This is the Ooh. On the Sport Live March Madness Bracket Preview. Okay, let's so start. And, and listen, it's never too soon because it always ends up happening to you. Anyway, Ooh. let's throw out the bracket comparisons, resumes, quad one, two, three, and four, last four in, last four out, and net. What is net? That actually needs to go. Oh, I'm sorry. This is Rick Pitino's words. You're not pulling Rick Pitino in this I'm house gonna, right now, all right? <laughs> I'm not going to play. I'm not going to plagiarize it. I'm not going to have a Zoom background that looks terrible of Madison Square Garden in back of me. Anyway. Throw out, we're going to throw out predictions and analysis tonight, and I did get one of the last teams in who's playing it right now. Neither of you two got your last team in, so nope. point to me. Talk about the games in the bracket and what will be the final four, or of what, okay. We'll also talk about the games in the bracket of what will be 64 teams at the end of this night now, but then at the end of the night, we'll tell you who the four teams that will be taking a trip to Phoenix for the 2024 Final Four, the only championship Phoenix will see in basketball this year. So, we're going to go region by region, one half of the bracket at a time, and then I'll pick a game or two in each region for you to watch, and I'll chime in on the the analysis from my cohorts, cohorts time to time. With that being said, let's go. All right, let's start with the East and UConn, who finds themselves as number one seed for the first time in 15 years. True story, two of my better friends met on the night they lost that year in the Final Four to Michigan State. Since then, though, they have won three national titles as a three seed, a seven seed, and a four seed. That was last year. For the third time ever, by the way, two Final Four cohorts from that previous Final Four are in the bracket. And ironically enough, this half of the bracket with UConn. That would be San Diego State and Florida Atlantic. So, party, reunion, all that other stuff. Anyway, Jay's going to talk about the top half of the brackets tonight. This is going to be an interesting start for UConn. How do you see their path, and do you think they can get there? Yeah, you know, it's it's. Uh, I, I don't see them, you know, their, their, their pod is, you know, the 16 seed Stetson and the FAU Northwestern 8-9 game. The the other hat the other pod is number five San Diego State against number twelve UAB, bid thief right there, and number four Auburn versus the Ivy champ number thirteen Yale. I don't think the committee did the defending national champs and overall number one overall seed any favors with the way this region was set up. Um, they have the best number two seed in the nation in the bottom half of their draw. I'll leave that for Anthony. Um, but I agree with ESPN's Reese Davis who said on. Their net, their bracket breakdown show after the reveal on CBS that the Huskies head coach Danny Hurley probably doesn't care. The Huskies may be the most complete team in the tournament and may have the best chance to become the fourth number one overall seed to win the national title. The previous three are Florida in 07, Kentucky in 2012, and Louisville in 2013, and the first back to back champ since Florida in 2006 2007. As the rabbi well knows, the Huskies can beat you in a variety of, way, variety of ways, starting with All-American Tristan Newton, who averages 15 two points per game, seven boards and six assists. The do-everything point guard holds the school record for triple doubles with four and had seven games with 10-plus boards and five games with 10-plus dimes. 
Guard Cam Spencer is second on the team in scoring and assists, 14.6 and 3.6, and he knocks down his 5.8 three-point attempts per game at a 44% clip. Forward Alex Caravan is next at almost 14 a game, and he knocks down his 5.6 triples per game at a 39.5% clip. Center Donovan Klingin, uh, who may be the best defensive big man in the nation, the dude is an absolute beast in the middle, averages 12.5 points, 7 two boards, and 2.3 blocks, and that's just on 22 minutes a game per 40. That works out to t- almost 23 points, 13 boards, and over four blocks. That's Zach Eady territory, guys. You know, you throw in dynamic guard Stefan Castle, and this is a formidable starting five. U- UConn has the nation's most efficient offense in Ken, per Ken Palm, 126.6 points per 100 possessions, and they're just outside the top 10 in def- defensive efficiency as their 94.4 points per 100 possessions puts them at number 11. Klingon battled some injuries early in the season, but since he returned to the lineup full-time on January 17, UConn ranks in the top three in offensive and defensive efficiency per Ken Palm. Danny Hurley's team goes seven deep, so there's no depth issue here. Klingon is a security blanket for what at times can be a shaky perimeter defense. So getting him foul trouble is the key to ruining, to, is the key to running. Uh, getting him into foul trouble is key, as is running Spencer and Caravan off the three-point line. Being able to switch one through four against them helps, especially since the Huskies don't have a lot of guys who can create off the bounce when actions break down. With all that being said, let's look at who has the potential to give UConn trouble in their half of the bracket. Um, as Rabbi said, Anthony has the bottom half. Number nine seed Northwestern is my pick to face UConn in the second round, and they could give Danny Hurley's squad a test. The Wildcats took Purdue to overtime twice this season and have one of the best offensive weapons in the nation. And first-team All-Big Ten guard Bo Bowie, great name, um, who averages 19 points per game and five dimes and knocks down his six three-pointers per game at a 44.3% clip, which is a huge jump from his 31.8 from last season and pretty much on the same number of attempts per game. Bowie doesn't shoot much from the mid-range, but he's one of the best pick-and-roll scorers in the country, and per synergy, he has an effective field goal percentage of 58.6% on shots off the dribble. Overall, this is the fifth-best three-point shooting team in the nation, 39% on a little over 21 attempts per game. Flip side is they allow opponents to shoot the three at almost 36% clip on 19 trips attempts per game. They also don't rebound the ball especially well, especially on the offensive end where their 25.7 rate is 287th in the nation. And their average is across the border in the 300s. None of this is helped by seven-foot center Matthew Nicholson, the Wildcats block leader and second leading rebounder being a potential game dime decision due to injury. He's been out since, uh, since March 2nd. I do think number four seed Auburn will come out of the other 14 pod in the top half. They could be one of the more dangerous teams in the tournament. The Tigers rank number four at Kemp Palm in overall adjusted efficiency. And they're a lot like UConn was last season. UConn was also number four on Ken Palm going into last year's tournament and was also a number four seed with the defending national champs, in this case, Kansas, as the number one seed in its region. Tigers have double-digit wins in 26 of their 27 wins. Last year, UConn had double-digit wins in 19 of their 25 victories coming into the NCAAs and then won all of its games by double digits. Auburn doesn't have an easy road, starting with number 13 seed Yale in the opener. Don't laugh or smirk. The Ivy League was one of the best mid-major conferences this year. Yale shoots 52.8% on twos, 34.7% on threes, gets on the glass and protects the rock. And if they advance, meaning Auburn, it's likely that number five seed Auburn, excuse me, will face uh, number five seed San Diego State, who has a different team from last year's Final Four entry, but has one of the college basketball's best scoring bigs in forward Jaden Ledee, who averages 21.1 a game and 8.4 boards, along with a defense that Ken Palm ranks ninth in adjusted efficiency. Bottom line, I think the top half of the region ends up being UConn and Auburn. And while the bottom half could be where danger lurks, I still think the Huskies will survive and advance to at least the East final. Danger, danger, Will Robinson, danger. (laughs) UConn bottom half of the bracket in the East did not get any favors whatsoever. The two (laughs) and three seeds are major conference tournament champions in Iowa State and Illinois. And to that major conference surprises at BYU and Washington State, and Drake and Duquesne, who got on a bit of a roll in winning their conference tournaments. Anthony, uh, let's talk about the eyes that, that, that might have it for a second in Iowa State and Illinois, and uh, give us a little bit more on the bottom part of the bracket. Uh, the two C Iowa State Cyclones, they, their, their bread and butter this season has been on defense. Few teams wear down an offense like the way the, the Cyclones do. 
the double team, the constant double teaming, the swarm the basketball, and the turnover is twenty turnover turnover rate uh percentage twenty five point seven. Uh, defensive turnover percentage is, is second nationally, and they also go on a lot of 10, 12 0 runs that, that tend to sink their opponents. Uh, the gritty team, the the down, they, they do the dirt work. Um, give me just a second. And uh, they're led by the they, the problem with the Iowa State is they don't have consistent, they don't have that one key scorer, and they do a score by committee. Uh, Tame and Lipsy and Keyshawn Gilbert are the two catalysts for that. As they've had several players that have scored 20 or more points throughout the season. Lipsy is a local kid, ranks uh, among the nation's most reliable point guards. Fantastic defender in addition to leading the team in assists and steals. Gilbert, the guy, uh, transfer from UNLV, leading the score and second in assists and steals to Lipsy. Gipsy and, Lib- and, and Lips- Lipsy and Gilbert both as a guard rebounders as well. Uh, I will say, I talked about their turnovers. They're t- they have a turnover margin of 6.8. Uh, plus this point, which is second nation, uh, to Houston. If there is a weakness to the Cyclones, it is shot making. They do tend to go on score, uh, scoring droughts. Keep in mind, they won the, the, the conference championship 69 to 41, mainly because of the defense. And, uh, they do, they won the, the two seed, the, they won the, the high seeds, uh, that I'm going to be talking about that actually do have an issue with scoring droughts, uh, that could be a problem that could leave the potentially open. Uh to an upset. The three seed, the the fight Illinois, uh fell out, uh, fight Illinois. Fight Illinois. Uh, yeah, I'm all over the give me a second, I'm all over the place because here's the thing. I'm trying to talk to you and I thought I had to took my phone off and my brother's texting me left and right about <laughs> the tournament game that's going on. See, I'm telling him, you know, leave me the hell alone. Get your head of the right game, now. Anthony. Get your head of the game. Seriously. Yeah. Let's go. All right. <laughs> All right, the Long Nine the one of the more talented versatile teams in the in the in the uh, in the tournament. Uh top five offensively. The defense is inconsistent, which can be a bit of an issue. Uh, they the range just outside of top one hundred in defense. But offensively, Terry Shannon Jr. and Marcus Dom- Domas um are the guys who kind of lead the team uh, lead the team. Uh, Shannon Jr. Shannon Jr. capable of coming out empty like dominance. He's six ten, uh, and six foot ten. Com- uh, Coleman Hawkins to match a nightmare uh for defenders. Uh, Hawkins nailed more than thirty nine percent of his three pointers on the regular season. He's the uh Big Ten starters defender. Their weakness is just like uh our inconsistencies are uh, inconsistent all season. When they've been good offensively, they've been average to so so to nearly bad defensively. Uh, look at the uh, look at the bottom of the bracket. Um, I'm looking at that six eleven matchup with BYU, and in the second round, that could be potentially a uh, issue for uh for Illinois. They have a trouble guarding the pick and roll on offense, and BYU is one of the best pick and roll teams in the country. However, the way I have my bracket set up, I do have Iowa State. And uh, Illinois getting to at least the Sweet 16 out of the bracket. I don't see any upsets on the bottom half. Uh, maybe because I'm being uh, being biased and just wanted to go chalk. But I do see you, that. Man. Yeah, I don't see that. The, in the case of the Cyclones, uh, the offensive deficiencies, I don't see it becoming a problem in the early rounds. Maybe in the Sweet 16, so uh, if they get to, to the Elite 8, it could be an issue. Um Illinois, I think they could just outscore their opponents uh, offensively. So I have these two coming out of the bottom half of the East region. Um, maybe uh, a matchup next weekend. Yeah, I, I problem... said it to Rabbi. I think I said it to you when we were talking it at, at like like uh, during the the Big Twelve tournament. Iowa State is a scary good basketball team, man. <laughs> the problem with a lot of teams on this side of the bracket, especially BYU, and I'm going to call this the Virginia principle from watching last night's game, is BYU and Iowa State could both get cold in a hurry. And in March Madness, you have a 10-minute drought against a good team, you're going home. Let's be completely fair about this, because in this day and age, you can't score zero points in a nine-minute and 18-second span. All right, let, Virginia. Let, 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 let's be fair. Virginia let's is be fair. Virginia is uniquely like Virginia. pathetic in that regard. But, but you can, but you can't be uniquely pathetic at any time 
in this tournament. It's not like BYU at one point had 15 points in a half against Texas Tech. Texas Tech. I'm saying they deserve their ranking. They went into Kansas and did beat a fairly semi-healthy Kansas Jayhawks team at that point. But but I do think it's going to be very interesting to see that BYU Duquesne matchup is one of the first matchups on tomorrow's card. Mm-hmm. And that's something that I could easily see as an upset. Now, uh, top out of the bracket, I originally thought that was going to be my matchup to watch because Again, UConn has a chance to play two of their final four brethren from last year in the next two rounds at Florida Atlantic, who I was going to originally pick up as my matchup to watch. But seeing that the end of their season has been pretty bad, and also even though they did beat Arizona back in December, that's a team that can scare. And of course, San Diego State coming out of a very stacked Mountain West Conference, even though they were the fifth best team of the Mountain West Conference this year by, by seeding in terms of their conference tournament, they have a five seed because of the fact that San Diego State has a respect from last year and a great non-conference schedule. Those two games are going to be interesting, but I want to go back for my real game to watch to that bottom half of the bracket, which is taking place in Omaha this weekend. I think Iowa State is going to take care of South Dakota State. I've always, South Dakota State's always been a popular upset pick up over the last few years, but as to 15, probably not going to go out on a limb here and say they're not going to be the next St. Peter's. So in that case, I just do want to talk about Iowa State again. A very scary team this entire year, but they are a team that is going to go up against hotter offensive teams of the country. They might have to play Illinois. They might have to play Drake. Drake is the team that I'm interested in because they have a back-to-back player of the year, Missouri Valley player and Tucker DeVries, who just happens to be, like every team in Iowa, like Creighton, the coach's son, because why not? And yeah, they almost beat legit, Miami. Though. Yes, he absolutely legit. is. 10 out of the last 11 games that Drake has won, and uh, they almost beat Miami last year in the first round. That game went down to the final two minutes. So, I like Drake. Washington State has just come out of nowhere this year. If you saw them in the Pac-12 tournament, guess what? Doesn't really show what they really are. So Washington State, they, they swept Arizona this year, won, went 14-4 and four in their last 18, and have a guy by the name of Isaac Jones leading in both points and rebounds per game. He's their best scorer, but when they put a guy named Jalen Wells into the starting lineup, this team just started to roll, and he is now the third leading scorer on the Cougars. And so I'm looking at that matchup. Both of those teams are dynamic offensively. And if that can happen with Iowa State, where it's going to have to be, you're going to have to score in the 70s or 80s to win, uh, that goes to a back and forth. So I see that second round matchup as my matchup to watch. And of course, obviously, watch the Washington State Drake game tomorrow because very rare to see one of those two teams in the second round of the NCAA tournament. In fact, I think Drake probably has the better resume in the <laughs> NCAA tournament as Washington State does. So, uh, might very, be able to answer that. I, I, I think it might. It might be close, but I don't remember too much Washington State uh, great runs back in the past. They might have had a Sweet 16 appearance in my lifetime. I don't know. But, uh, that's my pick to go because uh, mm-hmm. that's my pick to watch. And that Omaha region, that bottom half is going to be very interesting. It's going to be a battle royale, so to say. I We'll get to our picks beforehand, but I do like UConn as of right now coming out of this region, but we'll talk more about that later on when we go to our picks. All right. Let's move on. Let's scroll down the bracket or with your newspaper 10 years ago to the West region. The number one seed is the roller coaster ride known as the North Carolina Tar Heels. That ride up two years ago, they were 30 minutes away from a daddy as an eight seed. Last year, they were about 30 miles out of the NCAA tourney with two eventual conference players of the year. Their number one seed at eight, they're a pretty favorable region and uh, you have Alabama, and St. Mary's here in this top half as well, who saw their hopes and dreams dashed by eventual Final Four teams last year in San Diego State and UConn. Jay, 
You're the purveyor of the uh, North Carolina roller coaster. So step right up and tell me, can the Tar Heels squeak out of here and continue the ride to at least the Elite Eight? Yeah, I mean, has Hubert, has any coach had a stranger first three years on the job than Hubert Davis? His first year, he takes this team with an iron five uh, starting lineup to the final four, losing to Kansas in the national championship game. Then the following year, they become the first preseason number one to not make the NCAA tournament. Um, Love leaves. And this year actually has some depth. Other people stepped up. He becomes coach of the year. And they have a chance to, and they have the makings of a team that can get back to the final four. It's crazy. Um, this is a very interesting region to me. So I, I, my deep dive came away with a lot of interesting stuff here. So let me, let me, let me dive right in. So obviously, you know, the, the, the heels will start uh, against number 16 Wagner tomorrow afternoon. Uh, the the Mississippi, Mississippi state, Michigan state is the eight, nine in that pod. The other pod is St. Mary's is the five against number 12 Grand Canyon. Um, and the 413 is Alabama versus Charleston. Um, now, while the region isn't a cakewalk for the Tar Heels, it is set up decently enough for me to envision a meeting with their old pal Caleb Love and the Arizona Wildcats in the West Final, which is the storyline the media would love to see happen. It'll all depend on which version of Hubert Davis's squad shows up. The one that smoked everyone in their path leading up to the ACC tournament title game. Eight straight wins, six to close the regular season, plus their first two in the conference tournament, allowing just one opponent to top 80 and holding four to under 70, or the one who seemed utterly out of sync offensively in this second half of the tournament final and lost to arch rival NC State. Now, bigs like NC State's DJ Burns that can bang with or even better than UNC center Armando Baycott can give them trouble, as can guards with length on defense, as the Hill starting backcourt of R.J. Davis and Ellie Cadeau is small. Both are maybe 6'1", and Cadeau is a zero from beyond the arc, just 8 of 44 all season. Cormac Ryan has been inconsistent from three. The six threes in the Duke game aside, he's two for his last 11. That's 18.2%. And Harrison Ingram just cannot go MIA. Four for his last 12 from the beyond the arc. As both are needed to space the floor on offense. And Ingram is counted on to help Baycott on the boards. Normally a strength for UNC, especially on the offensive glass. He has just nine in his last two games after leading the ACC in rebounding and conference play at 10.9 per game. When that starting five is playing at their optimum level, they are a final four unit. As I said on the last show, the Heels came into the ACC tournament leading with that top five defense per Ken Palm. First time in top, in top five on that list since 2011 to currently at number six as we head into the NCAAs, holding ACC opponents to just 68.2 points per game, 39.5% from the floor, and 30.7 from three all tops in the conference. Nationally, they held those opponents to 40.4 from the floor, 31.3 from three, and allowed them only a little over 70 points a game. Offensively, as I said, this is a somewhat typical U, still a somewhat typical UNC team. 81.6 points per game in the regular season, 22nd in the nation, led the ACC at 78.7. They led the ACC in free throws, free throw attempts, and nationally averaged as many free throws made as their opponents took, and that's a key piece of offense for them. Shooting guard R.J. Davis is the ACC's player of the year and one of the best guards in the nation. Led the conference in scoring at 21.1. His overall is 21.4. That was 11th nationally. 40.6 from three, 87.3 from the line, and invariably makes the right play at the right time. He did everything possible, maybe too much, in the loss to NC State. Heels are seven and four when he tops, when he hits 25 or more, 20 and three when he scores less than 25, which means other people are contributing. If he has to carry too much of the offense for UNC, that's a problem, which it was against NC State. He dropped 30 and they lost. As for that typical strength on the boards behind Baycott, a double-double guy, 14.1 points, 10.2 boards, and much improved defensively, less of risk on switches this season. And Ingram, uh, who averages nine overall and those 10.9 in conference, they led the ACC in offensive, defensive, and total rebounding, out-rebounding their opponents by almost seven per game, all of which should translate to the NCAAs and on paper says Final Four team. So who can give them trouble in their half of the bracket? Let's start with whoever comes out of that 8-9 game. Um, I know I'm breaking an unwritten rule about betting against Tom Izzo in March here, but I just can't give Michigan State the usual benefit of the doubt this time. I feel they should have been in the first four game instead of Virginia, as opposed to being a nine seed here. 
So I'm going to go with Mississippi State on this one. They have the bigs to bang with Baycott, starting with 6'11", 245-pound senior Tolu Smith, who averages 15.2 a game on just 9.9 field goals per game, and he demands double teams. And a perimeter threat in terrific freshman guard Josh Hubbard, who leads the team in scoring at 17 one points per game, 25.4 over his last eight. His range starts when he enters the arena, hits threes at a 35.8% clip, and on 8.6 attempts per Per game, he is utterly fearless, and those are two are pretty much the entire offense. Uh, defensively, states in the uh, states in the top five in the nation in efficiency, and they have length and depth. They hold opponents at just twenty nine point four percent from three. Doesn't bode well for Davis and Ryan getting too many good open looks from beyond the arc. Bulldogs head coach Chris Johns has a solid defensive scheme and a look to make UNC's non shooters like Cado put up shots. The Tar Heel freshman point guard has fallen for this dork defense before and has taken ill-advised threes only to stay under control and keep the ball moving. The issue with Mississippi State is that a big like Baycott, who can wall off Smith on defense and make him shoot over the top, can reduce his effectiveness, which can lead to non-shooters taking jump shots for a team that overall does not shoot well from three. They're thirty at 32.5%, at 265th in the nation. Another of State's biggest weaknesses is an NC strength, free throw shooting. The Bulldogs, 323rd in the nation out of um, in free throw percentage at a paltry 67.2%. Hubbard's the only one above 75 at 85.3. Smith, who averages seven free throw attempts per game, is awful, 58.2. All reasons I think the heels get past the dogs. I think the other pod goes chalk. Despite 12 seed Grand Canyon getting some chatter, I think 5 seed St. Mary's comes out of this game, and I don't see 13 seeded Charleston being a match for 4 seed Alabama. If you're UNC, St. Mary's is probably the better matchup, even though there is some strength on strength in the rebounding department. Gales are top 10 in the nation in both offensive and defensive rebounding percentage. Solid team, could give the heels fits with their slow, deliberate pace and preference for half card offense. Augustus Marshallonis is the WCC Player of the Year, but Aiden Mahaney leads them in scoring at 13-9 a game. Gales won 6-1 and one in this season when he scored 20 or more. They have five players in, averaging double figures in scoring. Alex Dukas, who drops his 5.5 three-point attempts per game at 44.2%. Mahaney, who drops his 6.7 at 36.2 with threats from beyond the arc. Big issue on offense is the same as Mississippi State's. They struggle at the line. 67.4% as a team, 320th in the nation, which is weird as four of their top six rotation players shoot better than 75%. Where the Gales, who are 16th in adjusted defensive efficiency per Ken Palm and 10th in effective field goal percentage, could run into trouble, is in a likely matchup with the Crimson Tide. By and by extension, the Tar Heels, if they survive Bama, um, is that their kryptonite is a team that plays with speed and attacks off the bounce with athletic downhill guards. What does Alabama do? That's right, the number two team in the nation in adjusted offensive efficiency per Ken Palm at 125.6 plays at the fastest pace of any power conference team and leads the nation in scoring at 90.8 points per game. Nine times this season, they've topped 100, and overall, they hit 95 or better 14 times. Led by senior guard Mark Sears, the SEC's leading scorer at 21.1, knocks down his 5.4 three-pointers per game at 43.1%, and his 6.5 free throws per game at an 86.1 clip. Nate's o Nate Oates' squad leans hard into the math that dictates scoring by only shooting threes, layups, and free throws. Here's the thing, and it's why I'm leaning towards St. Mary's when so many are taking Bama. The tide flat out does not play defense. They're 112th in defensive efficiency on Kempom and have given up 90 points or more five times. The major lack of rim protection is due to last year's leading shot blocker, seven foot center Charles Badeko, leaving school, but the rest of the team shows an egregious lack of effort. Oates doesn't even try to hide it on the, anymore, saying, quote, everybody knows we don't really guard at this point. I can't see a team that has to has to score 100 every night going to the Final Four. To use Rabbi's favorite word, you got to at least be serviceable on defense. The Tide is nowhere near that, and worse, they do not seem to care. No program has more Final Fours than the Tar Heels 21. It's the West region set up to notch, get them number, you know, notch number 22. Based on all of this, if the Duke slaying version of UNC shows up, I think the top half is. The only danger I see is if Alabama gets past St. Mary's. Bama has the ability to run anyone out of the arena, and if the wrong version of NC shows up on that day, the tide will roll. I'm not 100% sure if North Carolina could take on St. Mary's in terms of in a slog game, too. It's just a question of can North Carolina just adjust to whatever game that they're being played 
whether it be Alabama or St. Mary's. Uh, I, I think they can. When, when North Carolina shoots themselves in the foot it, it, is when they way. try, is when they literally just get stagnant on offense. The thing that I, that I notice most is, as I said, you know, it's rare that this is a team that leads with his defense, but it does in that attempt to come back late in the second half against NC state in the conference final, they forced turnovers on multiple NC state possessions only to have it, have it, you know, display woefully bad offense in attempting to convert those into points. And that's what ultimately doomed them. It's a question of whether or not they manage to play their game, stay in their actions, and they need, it's key, key that Cormac Ryan and Harrison Ingram actually be there doing what they were hired, brought in to do. If those guys do not play to their strengths, and provide though what they need to provide to the remaining three guys on that starting five, UNC is going down. Can't hey, you just convince Cormac Ryan that he's playing in Durham in the first two rounds instead yeah, of actually that's playing literally in what Charlotte? You gotta do. That's kind of what he has to do, considering yep. his two best games of his career for two different teams was. Oh, yeah. For the North did um, Anthony, let's talk about the other half of the West bracket, which actually features, get this, Teams that reside in the West. Go figure. Two seed Arizona, 10 seed Nevada, 11 seed New Mexico, and 15 seed Long Beach State. And let me just rant for a second. The fact that Long Beach State has a <laughs> literal lame duck head coach and Dan Munson still coaching them a is crazy my story, favorite storyline yeah. of the entire tournament. I am rooting for them all of the way. They're going to feel like home in the Western Conference, but in the Western region. <laughs> the Western <But> region. <laughs> Western region, Western Conference, you know, same thing. Yeah. Third seed Baylor, six seed in Clemson, and seven seed in Dayton are no slouches either, and they'll be happy to trade in their frequent flyer miles to go to crypto.com <laughs> or be the next, Friday, next uh, weekend for the regional in LA. Anthony, analyze this. Yeah, you know, our last, uh, last show, I talked about the Arizona Wildcats and how they will one bad road loss to USC away from possibly being a one seed, to, especially how they toned down during championship week. But uh, this is a two team, the two seed that could be easy masquerading as a one seed. They're, being a, they're one of the most explosive offenses in the country by far. They're led by Pac-12 player, the uh, Caleb Love, who uh, we talked about. How weird does uh, that at, sound? Ab nauseum Ow. on this show. It was needed. How That's weird does sure. that sound, though? It just it was so it was needed for him. It worked out for the best for everybody. It, it did, but it still sounds weird that Caleb Love is a conference player of the year. Yes. Well, he's a well, he's always been a walk-in bucket, but under uh, uh, Tommy Lloyd this season, he's, he's been more of a proficient. Smart. Walking bucket, which has helped the Wildcats uh, ten times over, but uh, he's he's able to get twenty five or more any game. Omar Barlo is uh, the big man inside that could be a handful. Uh, and San Diego State transfer Keyshawn Johnson for five, gives the Wildcats a multi dimensional defender yeah, that can the lock, ball, baby. Yeah, that can lock in. Uh, that can lock in on any uh offensive player. The the key players though for the Wildcats is point guard. Uh, Kylan Boswell and uh, Pell Lawson. Boswell, he's strong and explosive, while uh, Lawson, he, he can do it all for Arizona. And he's, and he's um, pretty much just worked, uh, and he projects as the, uh, get this, this is uh, according to ESPN's uh, Jay Billis, the Christian Braun of the Wildcats. <laughs> so, Hey, look, Jay Bill has been there for long, longer than I have, so I want to take his vote for it. Oh, without, without so, a doubt. That, without a doubt. Yeah. It just sounds it's just, that's kind of funny, though. <laughs> yeah, they got the full star matchup against Long Beach State. And look, yes, the, the, the team that won the conference, the conference championship with a lame duck coach, it's a great story, but I just think the Wildcats is just way too much uh, offensively, top to bottom. They're, uh, they're one of the more uh, consistent and probably overall better teams in the, in the country by far who just uh, have the luxury of being a two. Which isn't so bad, considering when they were in Salt Lake City, uh, which allowed their fans to travel if they could get through the first weekend. They were in crypt they were at the Crypto.com arena, so and, and if they get through that, they get a nice little bus ride from campus to uh to Glendale, Arizona, for the Final yeah. Four. 
Yeah. Absolutely. But uh, going to the other side of this uh, this other part is the Baylor Bears. And Scott Drew's team is playing in the right direction. They can shoot. They're one of the best offensive teams in the country. Their top five offensive efficiency and lead the nation in three-point shoot percentage, knocking down almost nine per, day, per game. My, one of my favorite names, Jacoby Walter, uh, Jalen Bridges, Jalen Nunn, and R.J. Dennis. Okay, they can all shoot. They're a very good passing team. They average more than 15 assists per game. They're a great offensive rebounding team, including the long rebound. Walter's a walking bucket after a slow start to the, to the season. He's shooting the ball well. Dennis, a former MAC player of the year, is the leading scorer and the, and the Big 12 sixth leader and the leader, the team leader in steals. Uh, one, one of the things is about the Bears that while they're great offensively, they're not as stingy as they could be on defense. And, and they're even worse when big man even Missy is not in the, is not on the court and uh the front and that um and the the pain is vulnerable. So they are very vulnerable. Oh, what is it? Uh, we uh we lost, lost the, the rabbi, rabbi for apparently. a second. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's been a but, it's been a long show between the rabbi. We lose the rabbi and my brother in the, just being very ill time interrupting me in the yeah, first yeah, segment. Yeah, yeah, no, but keep 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 breaking but, it down, Anthony. Keep yeah, going. The power of, the power of live stream, man. His name. There you go. Uh, but yeah, down. um, looking at the uh, looking at this this side of the bracket, uh, the bottom half. New Mexico is a, is has been a kind of a sleeper pick to a lot of people as far as uh upset uh upset special because Clemson while they have been good has been inconsistent at times. But on top of that, they tend to go up and they go they get up and down for opponents uh which has been a major problem this season. And New Mexico can score. They are a very mm-hmm. good offensive team. Um, then I'm looking at Dayton and Nevada. I think Dayton comes out of that matchup, but um, I do see I do see Arizona getting out of this out of this as the two. Baylor may have some issues if they go up against New Mexico in the second round, but I do think Baylor has enough offensive to get through it. Um, however, it is going to be depending on their defense and if they can mm-hmm. uh slow down, get enough stops against New Mexico, they should be uh they should be able to get through the next weekend. Yeah. Um, Rabbi just texted me. He's having internet issues. Uh, but since we're still live on Facebook, you and I are going to keep this going. Uh, cause yeah, sure. On. <laughs> um, I will tell you, uh, give me a second. I'll pull up the outline. I can tell you who, uh, Rabbi's pick for, uh, his, the game he wanted to watch the game he was looking for. Um, for yeah, the- I think I have it here too. Uh, for yeah. the West region, it is, um, Purdue and Utah state. Actually, yes. that's a, Yep. Yeah, so it's, yeah, the one the one eight matchup. Uh a potential yeah, in the one eight second matchup. round. And you know, that it's a very interesting matchup. Uh let's see, where are we? Uh what was it again? It was it was uh the potential one eight. It would be uh Purdue and Utah. No, that's State. Mid, that's that's Midwest. The the Oh that's my Midwest. Okay. Yeah, Hold on, his let's go. West oh. game to watch. Ah, oh, wait, West Legion. Ah, oh, here we go. Uh, St. Mary's and Grand Canyon. That's the 512, actually. Yeah, I mean. Hi. I, and the rabbi's back with us. Hey, right. there you <laughs> are. We were, we were, you literally, we were literally just about to kind of like cover your, uh, your, your, your matchup to watch in the West Region and you're back. <laughs> yeah. But so, the, well, since, take it away. Well, it's your I, turn. Yeah. <laughs> well, uh, you know what? Since I uh, mentioned it, I will set you up on this one, Rabbi. Uh. You have the five twelve matchup with your uh game to watch uh in the West Bracket, which is St. Mary's and and Grand Canyon. You know, I would be great to actually introduce that myself on this one, but I got it. Uh yeah, <laughs> this He's uh frozen again. He's frozen. We'll That's... give him a minute to un- Oh there we go, there we go. Oh. Here we go. Okay, so St. Mary's and Grand Canyon. Interesting grouping here. Um, I have to say, St. Mary's, uh, I don't know if you mentioned the fact that they are number two in the country in defense, Jay. They only give up less than 60 points a game. And uh, you can bring up all your deficiencies in there, but this is a team that's also had a 15-game winning streak going into this tournament. The last loss that they had was back to Gonzaga in January, and they defeated them twice since then. Uh, 
one team that you're going to have to really struggle against. And I think a team like North Carolina, by the way, would really struggle against a team like that. However, when you look at all of this, when you look at all of this, St. Mary's has a tough opponent at Grand Canyon. They have a 14-game winning streak this year after an early season loss to South Carolina. They've beaten San Diego in this tournament as well. And they have uh, a guy named Tyron Grant Foster, who almost averaged his 20 points game, 37th in the country in defense. I, I love this guy. He is going to be a guy who's going to have to kind of be the offense for this team and kind of get to his average to just have a shot at winning this game. And I think you're going to see a hard nose struggle. This team has been in this situation for three out of the last four years. And guess what? Bryce Drew is the coach of this team. Ironically enough, we were talking about Scott Drew. This is also, by the way, uh, New Mexico is also in this bracket with uh, Richard Petito. Mm -hmm. In bringing in, bringing in the family and, flag. <laughs> yeah, and considering they were also a bit stealer, I love New Mexico in this region as well. So I, I really think this West region is which it should be if it has the number four seed in it. This is the wildest region that I I am going to that I think we're going to see, and I really think that if I had to bet on a number one not getting out of their region, I think, Jay, it would be right here just because of the inconsistency that North Carolina has had this season. But I don't know. There's a lot of good matchups in this region, too. I think that North Carolina possibly against Mississippi State, considering what they did against Tennessee in the SEC tournament, might be must-watch. There's a reason why no ones or twos or threes in the Final Four last year. Oh, by the way, I'm picking some 512s this year because it's time we need to bring the 512 upset back. Make the 512 upset great again. There's been only, there were more <laughs> 16 seeds that beat one seeds than 12 seeds beating five seeds last year. That's right. No 12 5 upset. Yeah, no 12 5 upset. 116, 116 1 upset. All right. So uh, you might see that as a theme going into the final two regions. Speaking of, let's move to the South with Houston. Number one in the AP poll going into champ week, put together some amazing defensive games in the Big 12 tourney, and then got waxed by Iowa State. Some stats for you. Houston scored the least amount of points by any AP number one since 1982 and lost by the third biggest margin of victory by an AP number one ever. And number two on that list was the Luau Cinder. It was Houston losing to the Luau Cinder UCLA Bruins. Yeah, that. So Houston is, what could we say? Oh, yeah, Jekyll and Hyde. So is number four, Duke. Number five, Wisconsin. And number nine, Texas A&M. When they're bad, they're bad. When they're good, good. So, Jay, yeah, Houston has a knack of getting out of this weekend, number one at least. Can they do it again? <laughs> Here's the thing, you know, their 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 half of the pod in the top half is, you know, they get Longwood number sixteen in in the first round, and that's a bid thief right there. Um, no, you what know, they that? No, well, not, not, not I'm not a, not a bid thief, but they're 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 they're. they're, they're, they're let me explain. I know where you're going to correct me. They are not a bid thief, but they are not nowhere near among the top tier teams in their conference. Um, Nebraska, Texas A&M is the eight nine game. Uh, the other half of that of the of the pot, the other pot is, as you said, Wisconsin against James Madison and Duke versus Vermont. Uh, I, I'm not sh like you guys. I'm not sure what to make of Kelvin Sampson's team. I mean, they these guys dominated the Big 12, winning the regular season title in their first year in arguably the best tough or tough, you know, toughest conference in the nation, at least according to the metrics. Uh, the team that thoroughly ran Kansas out of the gym in the regular season finale themselves got run out of the gym in the Big 12 tournament by Iowa State. Was that a bump on the in the road, or did Iowa State provide the rest of the South region teams a blueprint to beat the Cougars? At their best, Houston is flat out the nation's best defensive team, even if Iowa State jumped them in Ken Palm's adjusted defensive efficiency metric after the Big 12 tournament. And to borrow from ESPN's Jay Billis and his bracket breakdown, um, relentless is the only way to describe their swarming physical defense, 
Houston will blitz ball screens, bring violent double teams in the post, and leave opponents bruised and battered after 40 minutes of near suffocating pressure. The numbers back that up. The Cougars are number two in effective field goal percentage, 44%. Block rate, 16%. Steal rate, 15.5%. Their top five in turnover percentage, 24.7. And two-point field goal percentage defense, 43.4. And just outside that for three-point field goal percentage defense, 29.6. They held 11 opponents to under 50 points this season. And between January 13 and March 9, Houston lost only one game and committed turnovers on just 12.2% of its possessions per Bartofic.com. Houston is a top 20 offense. They're 118.8, ranked 17th per Ken Palm, despite the fact they're not an overly great shooting team. Their 48.4% field goal percentage is 282nd in the nation. Their 34.7% from three on 22.2 attempts per game is 145th. Their 69.4% free throw percentage is 290th. And their effective field goal percentage of 49.7 is 232nd, which is the lowest among all teams that are seeded one through five. Their ability to get points off their defense with the steals and forcing of turnovers helps offset the shooting, as does their ability to get up on the offensive glass. Their 13.7 offensive rebounds per game is 10th in the nation. Their 36.9 offensive rebound percentage is 13th, which gets them plenty of second chance opportunities. It starts with it all starts with Kelvin Sampson's extension of himself on the floor. And that's point guard Jamal Shebb, who's averaging 14 points, 7.3 dimes, and 4.2 boards and 2.6 steals over the last 10, and was named first team all American on Tuesday. He's one of the best on ball defenders in the nation and the point of the spear of this defense. On offense, he orchestrates everything and is pretty much the definition of clutch. His backcourt mate, LJ Cryer, leads the team in scoring at 15.3 a game and is a sniper from the on beyond the arc, knocking down almost eight attempts per game at a 39% clip. When the game is on the line and Houston needs a bucket, Shed is fearless and can practically get one on sheer will alone. The thing, the other thing to watch for Houston is health. After losing key reserves, Terrence Arsenault, Jojo Tugler, and Ra Ramon Walker Jr., Houston is very short. So seeing leading rebounder Jawan Roberts go down with a knee injury in the Big 12 semis and only be able to go for 13 minutes in the final is a concern, though he was not on the injury report coming into the NCAA tournament. Roberts and the Cougars' other big, Javier Francis, are the keys to the interior defense, the offensive rebounding, and as rim runners and finishers. If the team who blitzed the Big 12 in the regular season shows up for the NCAAs, they can take the region. If not, here are some folks who can knock them out. Texas A&M is my pick to come out of the 8-9 game. Aggies can match Houston, physic they're cute match Houston physically. They're the best offensive rebounding team in the nation with a 41.9% rate. All six of their top minutes getters average at least three offensive rebounds per game with Anderson Garcia pacing them at four and a half. So they get plenty of second chance points opportunities, mostly because they don't do well overall on their first chance points opportunities. Their 39.9% field goal percentage, 348th in the nation. 28.4% on threes, 354th. Luckily for them, they have a pair of guards that can get buckets. Wade Taylor, the fourth, leads the Aggies in scoring at a little under 19 a game, but his production is based more on volume than efficiency. He shoots just 36.9% from the floor on his 16 field goal attempts per game and just 31.5% on his 8.2 triples per game. His backcourt mate, Tyrese Radford, is a similar scorer, shooting just 40.6% from the floor on 14.3 field goal attempts per game and 27% on his 4.2 threes per game. On the flip side, both rebound well over three offensive boards a game, and they get to the line almost 10 times per game between them. The offensive rebounding will be a strength on strength situation. And while the Aggies are five and one and averaging 83 points per game since moving Andy, uh, Manny Obaseki into the starting lineup, I'm still inclined to give the Cougars the edge on the offensive end. While lots of folks are looking at number four seed Duke and number five seed Wisconsin as potential upset victims, number 12 James Madison and number 13 Vermont are getting some chatter in that regard. I see both of these games going chalk especially if the Wisconsin team I saw take down Purdue in the Big Ten tournament shows up against JMU, and Duke decides to bring what head coach John Shire calls competitive fire against the Catamounts, still one of the all-time great team names, and at a level that matches the talent that the Blue Devils are loaded with. Duke has one of the best starting fives in the nation, led by All-American sophomore forward Kyle Filipowski, 17.1 points per game, 8.2 boards and 1.6 blocks. Fellow sophomores, forward Mark Mitchell and wing Tyrese Proctor, along with freshman sharpshooter Jared McCain, plus senior 
point guard Jeremy Roach round out that starting five. That quintet all average double figures in points per game for the nation's number seven offense per Ken Palm, which can score on anyone inside or out on any given night. They don't have a true rim protector on defense, and they don't force a lot of turnovers, but they do guard the three pretty well. They only allow opponents to shoot it at 32.6%, and they shoot it pretty well themselves. They're at 37.7%. Overall, is 15th in the nation. They spread the floor around Filipowski, don't turn the ball over. So if they can keep their big men out of foul trouble and bring the aforementioned competitive fire, they can be a problem for teams. If they can get past the Badgers, who among other, other attributes are built to take advantage of Duke's lack of interior defense with seven-foot senior big Stephen Crowell, who could cause some foul trouble for Filipowski in the post. Badgers are 15-6 and six when he scores in double figures. And along with 6'9", Tyler Wall, and even 6'11", Nolan Winter, Wisconsin has plenty of bodies to throw at the Duke forward on the defensive side like they did against Zach Eady in the Big Ten tournament. Though ideally, they don't want to have all of them foul out as overall they don't have a lot of depth as head coach Greg Gard's bench is in the bottom third in the nation in terms of minutes played. When the Badgers are playing their preferred style of ball, they protect the rock, they don't foul, they rebound decently, and they control tempo, which historically has made them tough to play and tough to beat. They have a solid three-guard backcourt, starting with St. John's transfer A.J. Storr, who has really blossomed after leaving Madison Square Garden for Madison, Wisconsin. Leading the Badgers in scoring at 16-9 a game, he went on a serious heater in the Big Ten tournament, putting up 22.5 points per game and knocking down his 6.5 three-point attempts per game at a 38.5% clip well above his regular season marks of 4.2 attempts per game and 32.7% conversion. Max Klesmet is the sniper, 38.9 from three on four and a half attempts per game. And point guard Chucky Hepburn is solid running the pick and roll and he leads the team in assists and steals. Opponent's style or pace of play doesn't negatively affect what they do. Ken Palm has them ranked 12th in adjusted offensive efficiency and 49th in adjusted defensive efficiency, which is somewhat misleading as during the last month of the regular season, they ranked 299th in effective field goal defense, allowing opponents to shoot 51.6% on twos and 39.8% on threes. And then they went on a run through the conference tournament. Just like with Duke, how far the Badgers go really does depend on which version of them shows up. It's why I keep going back and forth on this matchup in my own bracket. Each has the ability to get to a to get to a potential Sweet 16 matchup with Houston and potentially knock them off. But for my money, the real threats to the Cougars getting out of getting to Phoenix will come from the bottom half of the bracket. Uh, by the way, take a shot every time someone says, I see it going chalk during this preview tonight. You will yeah, yeah. One, one of y'all can take the shot for me. You know I don't drink. Um, okay, well, <laughs> that means I'll drink double. I'm perfectly fine with that around March Man this time. All right. Oh, Rabbi taking on the mantle of Jay's designated Designated drinker is always a good spot to get. Okay, so by the way, there you go. <laughs> I'll right. hold you to that if you be, if you get a beer on Sunday when I see you in Brooklyn. <laughs> Promise to do that. Uh, six time, by the way, six national champions in this bracket overall. Six teams who have hung banners up in the past. Uh, by the way, before we get to the next portion of our bracket, which includes NC State and my new favorite player DJ Burns, let me please. Uh, tell you the quote of the year that I've heard. I wanted to play my game growing up like Akeem Olajuwon, but after I saw my body type, I've learned I'm just like Zach Randolph. So (laughs) that is why I love birds. All right, so the bottom of the bracket where we talked about Marquette and Kentucky last week on our show as two teams that we were looking at to have a strong conference tourney week. Well, when behold, they find themselves as two and three seeds here respectively. The six seed Texas Tech and seven seed Florida also hold in, held sell, solid conference tournament performances in strong leagues. That could boost them right here. And oh, yeah, number 11 seed NC State became the second team ever to win five conference tourney games in five days to skip onto the field. The first team was the Kemba Walker Huskies, who had their one shining moment cutting down the nets in 2011. Anthony, star studded bottom of the bracket. Who are you looking at? Well, I'm looking at the two C Marquette Golden Eagles. And by the way, here's a here's a fun fact. Uh Shaka Smart has not made it to the second weekend of the tournament since the twenty eleven final four run. So what? that is huh? over yep. a decade. Wow. Since he's been able to, since he's been able to get past the opening weekend. Wow. But uh the Golden Eagles of uh, the twenty five win team come out of the big East, and we talked about them uh last week. Uh, they're an outstanding, unselfish team. They force a lot of turnovers. They can make the game chaotic for their opponents. But every day, again, focuses on the health of Tyler Kolick. I mean, he is the quarterback of this team. He did not play 
in the uh the Big East at any point in the Big East tournament. He's the his first team all Big East. Uh, and he just pretty much make this team. This team is already good, but with Coley, a healthy Tyler Coley, this team could potentially go on a Final Four run. We know about Cam Jones picked up a lot of scoring slack uh during the Big East tournament. He could score thirty on a given night. Uh, also, a dog roll was a guy who came back also from an injury. He's become one of the uh, more versatile big men in the Big East Conference. He's a playmaker who can pass. He can switch on a guard, defensive playing front. Marquette is not a big team. So teams said so they may run into a little trouble with a team that has size and that can rebound well. They may have lucked out in the fact that they could potentially go up against teams that don't quite do those things. So it may not hurt them as much. But I'll I tell you what, if they can get Cole back and uh, help at least close on but say this team can really go far in the in, in this side of the bracket. The Kentucky Wildcats on the other on the other side, they'll find mm-hmm. they'll uh they have the offense that is a that could potentially get this to the final four. Um they are one of the best transitional scoring teams in the country. They're led by the guards, Antonio Reeves, uh Reeves, Reeves Shepard, Rob Dillingham, and DJ Wagner. That's most of the scoring and on the speed of the team. Shepard is the best the team's best player. Leads the team in three point field goals, three point percentage assists and steals. Reeves is also the target of opposing the defenses as he can go off for 30 or more in any game. He's also consistent. Kentucky, if the Wildcats can defend and rebound, this could be uh, they could be arguably one of the fastest teams uh end to end this in this big and in this uh NCAA tournament. Now looking at their side of the bracket, uh the bottom half, and Texas Tech and NC State, you know what, NC State. Great story. They won. They went on a Kimmel Walker light one through the AAC tournament, five wins in five games. But eventually, fatigue will kick in, and for whatever reason, they got stuck with a Thursday game. So definitely not enough time to cover. I do think they're a good story, but I think Texas Tech balanced offense. Get, uh, well, get them out of out of that out of that matchup. Uh, Florida right now. Uh, they played the winner of this last playing game, which is already in progress. Going on a progress with Colorado and Boise State, I do think Florida wins that matchup. Uh, and we're looking at the, the second round. Kentucky, I think their offense is a little better. Texas Tech is more proficient, more balanced. But I think, uh, but the Wildcats, if this game goes to a shootout, I think the Wildcats do have enough more, enough firepower. Uh, and as far as uh, a potential Florida Marquette second round matchup. I do think Marquette, even if they don't have Tyler Kolig at 100%, is still good enough to win and get out of this um out of the second round. So, I, I, yeah, I think we said it uh, already about the going chalk, but I don't see any potential upset in this bracket. I think there are some good teams, uh, but not. I don't think they're good enough to maybe give a skill in Kentucky unless Kentucky decides to take the day off defensively. Uh, Marquette, <laughs> which they do a lot, by the way. Right, yeah. what's, what's, what's the stat? What was the stat you gave us on Kentucky on the last? Either show? it was fourteen games this year where they they scored ninety or let up ninety or both in the same game. I mean, yeah, <laughs> yeah and Marquette, and like I said, Tyler Cole is the it's the help. I mean, they just got a guy back. Um, well, uh, they they just got a guy back. Now, on top of that, I, I forgot to mention this, too. And it's something I, I forgot about last show. They lost Sean Jones in January to an ACL injury. Yeah. That's another solid player defensively that would help this team out. So, right now, between health and death, uh, Marquette is, is playing kind of on thin ice. But I think they're going to have to get out of the first weekend. But um, you got to get your guys healthy. And that was the key. That was the difference between last last season's uh, tournament run that ended up short was they just didn't have the the best player being a hundred percent. But I do think it goes uh chalk on this side of the bracket also. The Sweet Sixteen round is going and, and beyond as well. Uh, both of these teams may run into some trouble because one uh is too inconsistent on the defensive side. The other one may not have enough bodies. Yeah, what's interesting about that side of the bracket is Marquette actually last weekend, I think, benefited a little bit without Tyler Collette because they could yeah. see what kind of team they had without him in there. And 
didn't cost them to save five. They're still over two in a region that is theirs for the taking. Because at full strength, they could probably play a 40-minute game with Houston. And definitely could play a game with Kentucky. That is for sure. I do like NC State beating Texas Tech on that bottom side of the region. I do think there's one more possibility of an upset. Don't yeah. see them getting any farther than that. No. But uh, when, when you're on a run that DJ Burns has almost 80% shooting from the field in his last two games and doing something like hitting that miracle three against Virginia. It's his first I, I really, year. Yeah. I, it, it, it was, it, I think this team is uh, a little bit of a momentum wave running into it. The Duke Vermont with Conseil James Madison sub regional has a lot of intrigue to me, and that's where I'm going to pick my game from because Wisconsin, even though that they uh, got themselves to the final, got the big win over Purdue in an overtime game, they had a three and eight stretch during the season, and uh, they got themselves a little back up with the tournament. They got a huge victory over Northwestern. I had said before. I actually know they got a huge victory against Maryland. I said before last week when I saw when I uh, talked to my friend Jay here, and I saw the score was sixty five twenty nine at one point. I'm like, when is Wisconsin ever scored sixty five points in their history? When you go back to the Bo Ryan Dick Bennett days of Wisconsin, you don't see numbers like that. So they've had runs, but again, they're not sustainable sometimes. In Wisconsin, a place that's not used to all of their offense, and uh, a team that can match up with them basket to basket is James Madison because they are the eighth best team in the country when it comes to scoring, and uh, they have a nice little winning streak going into this tournament as well. There's four teams in this region that have 30, uh, I'm sorry, there's four teams in the NCAA that have 30 victories, two of them in this region. Houston is one of them. James Madison is the other. They have a 13-game winning streak. They started this season with a 14-game winning streak and beat Michigan State on the road in the first week of the season. Nobody beats Izzo in March, but everybody apparently beats Izzo in November. That seems to be the motto. Uh, but they average 84.4 points per game. And uh, since joining the Sun Belt, they've really had – a nice little stretch. Uh, they haven't been to the tournament, though, since 2013. I think they could, they could easily make the most of it. This Wisconsin James Madison game, which will take place late night on Friday, and uh, that's the witching hour, essentially, for your college basketball tournament NFL red zone comparison for you. <laughs> and anything can really happen then. I really like this matchup, and uh, whoever comes out of this, whether it be Wisconsin James, Matt, Wisconsin Vermont, Wisconsin Duke or the Dukes versus Duke on Sunday, which is possible if it's James Madison and Duke. It's going to be a nice little fun Sunday at Barclays Center, and it's going to be very interesting to see a lot of good teams over there, too. I think Barclays Center, who is sending their top team over there this weekend for the first round and second round games, is the reason why they're doing that, because there's a lot of little intrigue in Brooklyn. Yeah, I mean, hey. Rabbi, the, only, the only thing I'm, you know, that's going to bother me about actually being there with you is that, you know, I won't be sitting on my couch, which means I won't be able to hear Bill Raftery say at tip off, and I an eagle, Duke goes, man, man. Uh, you know what? It's going to be nice to have you guys in my neck of the woods for a change. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> you know, a good parking spot also before. I not miss it. We're going to forget it. Okay. <laughs> Anyway, let's move on to our final region, which is Purdue, the college team equivalent of the guy going for fishing for that dollar bill in the Geico commercial. Huh, you almost had it. You almost had it. Go power. They're the number one seed in the Midwest. Nice, and Rabbi. You know, they're the number one seed in the Midwest, and we know what happened last year. Fairly Dickinson, 16 seed, second one versus 16 upset ever. But Virginia made the turnaround the year after that 116 debacle and won the title in 2019. Mm -hmm. So Purdue is hoping history can compete or transfer itself over. Fun fact, Virginia hasn't won a game in the NCAA tournament since their national championship, and that continues in 2023. Mm -hmm. 4C Kansas and 5C Gonzaga are brand names who have looked really good this year at times. And there are some sneaky surprises in this half of the bracket as well. Jay, do you believe in the Purdue Revenge Tour? 
revenge, redemption, whatever you want to call it, um, it's definitely going to be much, much watch. Um, you know, to, to say that the Midwest Midwest region's top seed has some tournament baggage it needs to unload is a Zach Eady sized understatement. Um, okay. As Rabbi said, everyone's wondering if they'll pull the Virginia and go from being a one seed bounced by a 16 one year to winning the national title the next. We all know the story, right? Virginia, 2018, overall number one, fell to UMBC as a 16 first round NCAA tournament. Following year, UVA improved going from being number 30 in adjusted offensive efficiency on Kempom to number two en route to cutting down the nets. Um, in 2023, Purdue became that second one seed to lose to a 16. FDU, fairly Dickinson, giant killer this time in the first round of the NCAA tournament. This year, the Boilermakers have one of the best offenses in the nation. Ken Palm has them number four in adjusted offensive efficiency, but they are number two in the nation from beyond the arc where they shoot it at 40.8% after being at only 32.2 last year. They also shoot it at 53% from inside the arc and are number four in the nation in assist rate at 64.5. Point guard Braden Smith is number two in the nation in assists at 7.3 a game. Edie, the reigning Wooden Award winner, is once again the focal point. He's averaging 24.3 points and 11.8 boards. EvanMaya.com considers him the most indispensable player in America. And no one else in all of college basketball so forces opponents to change their game plan to try and contain him offensively. And he's also shown some improvement as an overall defender, which has helped Purdue become a Ken Palm top 25 defense in adjusted efficiency. And if ever a bracket was set up for Matt Painter's improved backcourt and his Toronto Tower to shed that baggage and get to the regional final, it is this one. As for that backcourt, you cannot underestimate what a year of experience does. Smith and two-guard Fletcher Lawyer have both improved from their freshman season of a year ago. They play more under control and have improved their playmaking around Edie. Both are double-digit points per game scorers and knock down threes in the 44% neighborhood. Senior forward Mason Gillis also hits threes at an impressive rate, 48.3 on 3.3 attempts per game. But it's the addition of Illinois State transfer Lance Jones that has helped the Boilermakers get to the next level. Jones is a physical athletic guard who gives Purdue an efficient off-the-bounce option that they really didn't have last season, along with his ability to defend the most athletic opposing guard. As Jay Billis said on his analysis, guards win in March. This group has winning guards. Now, something to watch for is how they do at the line. Um, they're number eight in the, nation, in the nation in free throw rate, uh, 42.8%, and free throw attempts per game at 18. But their 72.1% free throw percentage is 176th in the nation, largely due to Edie, who, while he averages over 11 trips to the line per game, hits them at only a 71.6% rate and has 11 games where he hit less than 65%. If they knock down their free throws, protect the rock when pressed, they've had issues against the press this season. They've had 13 games with a dozen or more turnovers, and they execute on both ends of the floor for a full 48. They can get to Phoenix, and the top half of the region is set up well for them. I have Utah State coming out of the 8-9 game. The Mountain West regular season champs are a very balanced team, Four players who can take over the offense on an over night, led by the inside-outside duo of great Osbor. What a name. What a great name. Um, and point guard Darius Brown the second. Osbor is a matchup nightmare for any opponent. 6'8", 245, physical finisher at the rim where he does most of his work. He averaged 18 points per game on 59.2% point shooting on twos, and he gets to the line 8.3 times per game. He does only shoot it at 63.3%, so it's something to watch. He is a stat sheet stuffer, leading the Aggies in points per game, rebounding, offensive rebounding, and blocks, second in steals. Brown, his partner in crime, leads the team in assists and steals and is a 3-1 to one assist to turnover ratio. He's also the Aggies' best sniper. He knocks down his 4.6 point attempts per game at a 39.5% clip. Overall, though, this is not a good three-point shooting team. Their overall mark of 32.1% is 271st in the nation, and their 19.2 attempts per game is 291st. And they have issues with interior defense and rim protection, which is why I like Purdue to get past them. The other pot in the top half is where some gear could be some chaos. Um, I was surprised that Kansas stayed on the four line. I thought they should have been seated lower. And if the committee had known on Sunday that the Big 12's top scorer and Jayhawk Alpha forward Kevin McCullough, who leads the team in scoring and the conference in scoring, at, with 18.3 points per game and has averaged six boards and 4.1 assists, was going to be ruled out for the NCAA tournament. They might have dropped them to a five seed. When healthy, 
McCullough was KU's best player this season and arguably the best two-way player in the nation. He was the one guy who could slash to the basket. He's the team's best wing defender, best cutter, capable of making a jump shot. And the drop-off between him and Bill Self's next man up options, El Marco Jackson and Nick Timberlake, is huge. That makes the matchup with 13, number 13 seed Sanford, whose full game, full court press has led to a top 20 turnover rate of 21.8%. Knocks down their 25 threes per game at a 39.3 clip. Good for seventh in the nation. It's a prime candidate for an upset. One that I am picking, especially with Kansas down a key press-breaking ball handler. And with center Hunter Dickinson, who has struggled without McCullough alongside him, shooting just 43.1% as opposed to 54, 57.4% with him, he's still recovering from a dislocated shoulder. And the Jayhawks being the second worst three-point shooting team over the last six weeks. Overall, their 32.9 mark from beyond the arc is 243rd in the nation, and their 17.1 three-point attempts per game is 339th. As for the five-seed Gonzaga, who has made the NCAAs for the 25th straight season, I give them better odds than Kansas at avoiding the upset, though I fully expect number 12 seed McNeese State to give the Zags all they can handle. Like Sanford, McNeese State plays fast on defense. They force 16 and a half turnovers per game. Their 23% turnover rate is sixth in the nation. Their 10.4 steals per game is third. And will press, get into you, and pursue the basketball. Their top 10 in field goal percentage at 49.3% and three-point percentage at 38.8. And top 30 in effective field goal percentage at 54.9%. And they get on the offensive glass 32% of the time. They have four players who convert threes at better than 40%, led by do-everything guard Shahada Wells, who hits threes at a 42.2%, excuse me, 40.2% clip. He leads the Cowboys in scoring 17.8, assists at 4.8, and steals at three flat. Wing Christian Shoemate, who leads McNeese, who leads McNeese in rebounding at nine and a half and offensive rebounding at 3.6, while ranking second to Wells in scoring at 11.9. And guard DJ Richards leads the team with 80 made threes and knocks down his 5.4 attempts per game at a 45.2% clip. But at the end of the day, Mark Few just doesn't lose in the first round, hasn't since 2008. And the Zags have a huge height advantage over McNeese State, who is 337th in effective height per Ken Palm. Yeah, Ken Pomeroy has a metric for everything in college basketball. That right. height advantage starts with 6'9", 245 pound forward Graham E.K. The Wyoming transfer is the Zags' leading scorer at 16.5 points per game and does pretty much all of his damage in the paint, hitting 61.7% of his twos. He teams with 6'8", 225 pound forward Anton Watson, the Zags' second leading scorer at 14.4 per game, who's also a 60% shooter on twos. They both they lead Gonzaga in rebounding, both are a tick over seven per game. And they have a pair of 6'10 reserves backing them up who hit twos at a 72% clip and can also rebound the ball. Gonzaga has a decent starting backcourt. Ryan Nemhard at the point. He leaves them in assists at 6.7 a game and adds 12.9 points and 4.1 boards. And Nolan Hickman is at, at the two. He leads them in threes with 172 and he knocks down his 5.4 attempts per game at a 40.7 clip. And is the Zags' only real perimeter threat on a team that relies more on twos, they shoot 59% as a team, that's sixth in the nation, and are third in total twos made at 806, then threes to the tune of almost four to one, as only 24.4% of the Zag scoring comes from beyond the arc, which ranks outside the top 300 in the nation. They do take care of the ball, they get on the offensive glass, but this team is nowhere near the final four level squads that few has previously rolled out. However, I do expect them to get past McNeese State. At the end of the day, I don't think either potential Sweet Stick 16 opponents pose a real threat to Purdue, who may just have the easiest path to the Elite Eight of all the four number one seeds. Though there could be some teams who could give them challenge in the bottom half of the bracket. I want to talk about that Gonzaga McNeese State game for a second, not that game to watch, but two things that interest me. Number one, Mark Few is one of the cleanest guys, runs a clean program, is never the biggest fan of coaches who just break rules all the time his opponent <laughs> on the flip the side sh- his opponent will win as a show clause penalty from his time in lsu which means he still has to hold by standards until 2025 yep he actually left lsu right before the tournament last uh two years ago because of those violations but mcneese state remember i said 30 win teams this is yep, another one of those 30 win teams and they also have the largest turnaround by one team in a single season of 19 games 
from the previous season and his introductory press conference. Will Wade said the following, I can't wait to have the largest turnaround in NCAA history going from 23 <laughs> losses to 23 plus wins. He improved that by seven. So just Gonzaga McNeese State is going to be a point with doing that. It, it's a very interesting bracket, by the way. I don't know what Bill Sup was doing, but I have to give him credit for keeping the McCuller thing quiet the whole entire time. And as matter of fact, reason saying, yeah, we're trying to go down for the rest of the season. He knew all along. He wanted to make sure. But Purdue, that's a favorable bumps over here, I have to say. We'll talk mm-hmm. about that more when we do the predictions. But finally, bottom of the bracket is an adventure, starting with 2C Tennessee, who was entering this past weekend as a projected number one C, but after a Mississippi State that's drubbing in the <laughs> SEC tournament, uh, they went down to the number Midwest number two. You go down. Three seed Creighton, six seed South Carolina, and seven seed Texas were all one and done as well in their respective conference tournaments. But again, keep an eye out on the team that clawed their way and stole a Pac-12 championship, by the way. Bid stealer, by definition, is someone who steals a bid from a bid from a league that was yes, going I to be. I admitted I misspoke by using part. the term "applying I'm it to Longwood." I corrected I'm myself. You, you didn't need to correct me. You correct yourself, but I'm just going to let you know again, because remember, internet issues, all the other things, whatever. Yeah. Anthony, claw your way through our final section. By the way, the uh, two fifteen mashup is a bit of a family reunion. Bye bye. I think I sent this to you earlier. Yes, you did. Uh, Sakai Sakai Sigler of Tennessee is going up against his half brother, St. Peter's uh, Armani Ziegler. Um, it's amazing. Two fifteen mashup. Amazing. So, uh, yeah, that's going to be an interesting uh, family reunion. Uh, depending on how not this something you were talking about the dinner. Not not something you'll talk about at the summer family cookout. That's for sure. I don't think so, you, no. You might want to keep that I, quiet afterwards, depending on who wins that matchup. I think they're talking about any day but this game. But, uh, oh. yes. <laughs> uh, the Tennessee Volunteers, uh, Rick Barnes' team, they can score. And for, and they're led by Dalton Connect. It, t- no, it took me 24 hours to pronounce that name correctly, so bear with me on that one. Okay? Connect is a uh, transfer from North Car- Northern Colorado. We've been out of nowhere to become the SEC's leading scorer. And he's the most, and arguably one of the most dangerous scorers in the country. He go for 30 points routinely in SEC play. Whenever the volunteers need a bucket, can uh, talk, uh connect this Ben D guy to, to, that they go to. But the, the volunteers has been more than just him. Santiago Fescovi and Joshua Jordan James are uh, fifth year seniors who provide leadership to this team. Let's also be able to chip in on the, uh, on the scoring. On the uh, the scoring side of things, uh, James uh doesn't need the ball to be effective. He's been great with his defense, his rebounding. Uh, for, while Fiscovi has been able, his, his shooting has come around late in the season. Uh, the things with Tennessee is that you do worry about the uh, t- occasional scoring drops, and obviously, what happens if Connect doesn't get them the baskets they need. Yeah, they can uh go into some pretty lengthy scoring drops. I think I mentioned the team earlier. I can go on strong jobs. Tennessee can also. So, uh, and I'll get back to the, the volunteers in just a second. But uh, the three seed, Clayton Blue Jays, they're one of the few teams in the country that's ranked in the top 25 in both offensive and defensive efficiency. That, uh, Clayton is just one of eight <laughs> teams nationally that can hold that distinction. Uh, while last year's Elite 18 was better defensively, this team is still just as good. Um, they're led by uh, uh, they're led by Baylor Schiederman, uh since we said uh lefty, terrific deep shooter, high level rebounder, creative passer. Steve Ashwood, the uh, Utah State transfer, is second on the team at three points uh field goals made. And uh and it's the and it's the Blue Jays more dynamic slasher to the basket. Trey Alexander, Bosal Defender, another three point outside outside shooting threat. When they're able to spread the floor with so many capable shoes. Creighton is also a great mid-range shooting team, hit over 60% from inside New York throughout the season. Ryan Cogbrenner Cal- is the X-Factor. He's a big man who's a rim protector, operates very well in the pick and roll, and is a, and is a threat around the basket as far as the law pass. Looking at them, the bottom half of this bracket, uh, you mentioned Oregon being the, uh, the best stealer. I do have them winning 
that uh matchup against South Carolina in the in the uh five eleven the six eleven matchup. Uh Creighton, I have them coming out of their uh three fourteen matchup against Akron. Uh Colorado State's is gonna find out that Texas is not Virginia and that uh they're not <laughs> yeah, Texas is not gonna beat them it's not gonna beat themselves Man. for not hitting the side of side of our apartment building on a sunny day. So I do think uh Texas win that one. Tennessee and St. Peter, now we talked about chalk all so long. This this matchup actually scares me because if there was a, a potential matchup that could have everyone tearing up their brackets, this is it. Because the volunteers, they don't they do go into these all scoring trials, and you have the St. Peter's Peacocks. Remember, they had their own little Cinderella run of their own a couple years back. They're one of the best, def- better defensive teams in the nation. And they have a lockdown defender by the name of Latrell Reed, who was the Mac defensive player of the year, who can't be a, de- uh, who can't be a defensive stopper. And they have uh, a, guy, a guy by the name of Quentin Washington that can handle the score low. With the volunteers, and you think about that performance uh, against uh, Mississippi State in the SEC tournament, and, and it has you, this one has me worried. I, 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 I have Tennessee winning this matchup, but I would not be shocked if this is the upset that we that that just bust the bracket busted upset that we see just because I don't know St. Peter's they they're a team that you overlook they can play def they can defend if they can take care of the basketball they stay in game so all, they can stay in the game and it's one of the situations that sets up that if Tennessee. Offense is going to a drop. They they leave a team hanging around, mm-hmm. and you don't want to leave a low seed. We we've seen this ten times over. You don't want to have a, a low seeded team that have no business being in the game with five minutes left to play in a one or two possession game, and suddenly the sweating bullets. So that so while I think Tennessee has enough to get through it, this is the matchup that could potentially. Screw up everyone's brackets across the country if it does happen. Um, Creighton, I I have them beating uh Oregon in round two. I do think Oregon, uh, I do think Oregon uh carries the momentum for winning the Pac-12 uh championship to at least one more game. But I do think the Blue Jays have enough to get get to the Sweet Sixteen. Yep. Uh, Tennessee, I keep my fingers crossed because. I think everyone's brackets have Tennessee winning, but um, keep an eye on this ten, this two fifteen matchup. I mean, if Tennessee if they win, they're gonna have to have uh, Dalton Connect go off big because if he goes into a if he's had a bad shooting game and they don't have any other scoring options, uh, that could be trouble for the Volunteers. Well, here's the flip side of that, Anthony, and we saw this in a game at the end of the season for the Vols where. Connect was the only one doing anything. He had 41 of their 81. Um, and that's the flip side of it. If he's the only one scoring, then this you could have the same situation where they get bounced early because it means no one else on that team is doing anything and he has to do too much just to keep them afloat. That's not yeah, a good I, look, he's for. he's been he's been compared to Allen Houston, who was a great tennis ball ball mm-hmm. himself, but the volunteers, they're going to need some more offense outside of just him. Because if he's a one man show and if he and he's scoring majority of the time, that uh, what he can go on a, a Steph Curry Davidson like uh, run as far as carrying the team one at a one man show. But if he but if he have a, a tough shooting night, uh, Nick Barnes' team can, can be sent home earlier than expected. Yep. Uh, so this is a region here that's about coaches for me. We talked about Will Wade just beforehand. Lamont Paris of South Carolina, a team that nobody expected to do anything in the SEC, has a better resume this year at a six seed for them. But I want to talk about something that leads into my pick. And Jay's talked a lot about Utah State's players in this segment. I talked a lot about Purdue. So I want to talk about Daddy Sprinkle, the Utah State head coach, who, yeah, sure, he inherited he, – the, the Utah State made it to the tournament last year as a 10 seed. Yay. But then their head coach, Ryan Odom, got hired by VCU. So what happens when your head coach gets hired by a bigger head school? Mm-hmm. You have to reload. You have – you're going to see players leave. So 
Would you guys like to take a guess how many play, how many minutes, not players, minutes from last year's Utah State tournament team that made the tournament as a 10 seed uh, came back in 2023-24? Five. Four. Zero. 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 Yeah. <laughs> not, a, not a minute. And that's something I'm really interested in seeing. Just seeing this Utah State team, an eight seed, which is almost absurd for a team that finished 18th in the country in the AP poll. Mountain West, even though they got the most bids that they've ever had in their history. By the way, there are nine teams that play in the Mountain Time Zone in this NCAA tournament, including four in the first four this year, which is insane. But all of those Mountain West teams are ranked 8 through 11. I'm sorry, are ranked 5 through 11. I talked about San Diego State earlier, which is the highest, but Utah State, an 8. State, um, Boise State, a 10 in here. Colorado State, a 10 in here. New Mexico, a team with as good of a resume as almost any of the bubble teams, were literally called the bid sealer by the NCAA tournament that had a committee on Sunday. A lot of people thought they wouldn't have been dead. They were an 11. Every one of those seeds should have been seeded higher than Michigan yes. State. Yes. Wow. You finally have turned into Izzo on March. I, no, I, I can't I believe mean, you've um, done that. It's not a good, great team. Izzo did a yeoman-like job with what he was given. I think the committee gave, the, overseeded them. It sure um, did. Is, did to, with, look, I mean, we. St I think there was, wait, there was so much chaos after Saturday night. I mean, we had what, Rabbi? We talked about this. five bid stealers this year. We ended up having five after bid after what no. two in the last three years, and that had a cascading yeah. effect that forced them to each time a bid stealer happened, they basically had to a certain extent had to tear up the their 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 plan and start over. That's but that's what their job is. Anyway, uh, <laughs> this could be Purdue's worst matchup of the really until the Elite Eight because, as Jay talked about, Kansas and Gonzaga. They've had their issues this year a little bit, and obviously Kansas overseeded as a four. We've already talked about it, but Utah State, very underseeded as an eight. They have a very talented crew out there that really overachieved, and it's all about stories. This is all about, this tournament is all about stories, and I love this story, and I think no matter what happens, I think Purdue's toughest test in this whole entire tournament, at least before a possible regional final could be Utah State. By the way, another good coaching story led. Rick Barnes could face his old team in Texas yeah. in the second round of the tournament. So yep. it, it's a cruel, cruel world the selection committee is, and sometimes they know what they're doing. Even look at the women's bracket. There are a lot of stories we could talk about there with that, but we'll, we could say that for another day. But it's <laughs> very interesting bracket number two. A lot of these brackets are interesting, and the game so far – yeah, I would say three of the three of the full uh, okay, full four friend. games have been very compelling. Uh, uh, Virginia just I think I think Virginia that, 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 just to me. really upset a lot of people because, not just because of the performance, it's because I there were so many bubble sure. teams. There was St. John's, there was Seton Hall, there was Indiana State that I, I mentioned. There was a lot of uh of teams that probably would have performed Should better. Have. You oh, yeah, Virginia sure. had the no was even... business being in the tournament. I'm sorry. That is an yeah. indictment of the selection committee that they were that 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 they put NBA in the tournament. Yeah. I, I would say two days that stuck out to me with the commission with the the committee. Michigan State being 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 nice. I, I think that was like look. I think that was more like a we'll do it. I mean Tom Enzo's reputation got that got that high seed that the seed that high, but they, they I don't think they should have been seated that high. And also, no. St. John's not even a, considered a, a first team out. Uh, even yeah. though, yeah, and, and well, I think here, that here, one here, really, here, that, here, that was kind of a, a head scratcher. That no, they, that, actually, that, it's that, not. It's not to me, Anthony, because when you look at their resume, um, Seton Hall wiped the floor with them twice during the regular season. Everybody likes to, you know, talk about the heater that St. John's went on at the end of the season. And, you know, but as I said on the last show, three of those wins. DePaul and Georgetown, who are two of the worst teams in the country. Butler is at the same level as St. John's in that conference. And yeah, they had a good win against Creighton. But other than that, 
nothing to write home about. And Seton Hall's overall resume was better. And that's the thing that people don't understand is that it ma as I said to, to our, our pal Sean Roman when he was talking about this in our in the in the larger on the sports line group chat, it is not how many you win, it's who you win, when you win, when you win, who you win against, and when you beat them. And Saint And, and where. And, and where. where. Yes, and where. And that's the thing. And the committee chairman fully said that he looked, they they look one of the things that they really look at is non-conference strength of schedule. Not great by St. John's. Um, look, uh, do I think the Johnnies deserve, and here's the other thing. If you're spending the entire bubbles, uh, you know, the bubble season w going back and forth between last four in and first four out, that doesn't mean you're in. Just because going into your conference yeah. tournament, you're listed as last four in, that doesn't mean you're in. You are still yeah. literally, you are walking the line on the bubble. The, the first four in, la you know, for last four in, first four out is just opposite sides of that same tightrope that you're walking. It doesn't mean you're in. Yeah, and, and also bid thievery like, and bid thievery is a domino effect, and it knocks people down. Let's yeah, let Anthony finish, finish over for, here before we get to predictions. Yeah, and I was saying this too for for Indiana State. Um, and, and this is the thing. Look, a lot of people talked about mid majors not getting the benefit of down, and 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 I, I mentioned on the last show the mediocrity of the power power conference is being rewarded more. But Indiana State, and here's the thing. You can you, when you have the opportunity when you have destiny in your own head. You see this in in the NFL in late in the season when you have control of your own destiny and you just win your way in, and you don't get the job done. This is the faint you you. This is the the day you push it. The situation you push yourself in where you don't have control of your own destiny and you have to sit around all week and basically be spectators and hope that someone else fall. And and we saw. There was a number of bid stealers that got into the tournament, five that got in over the weekend, and that just made it even even more uh, susceptible that they would be left out. Like a good back to the Johnnies. Um, I thought, that, look, I understand that the the the, the out of conference schedule is what hurt them probably more than anything. I did give them a lot of credit for for uh, get coming on late. They beat Seton Hall, and I joked about. I thought that was kind of the matchup. Uh, to avoid the first four, of course, that was going into before the weekend we saw, mm -hmm. and also they hung tough against UConn, who everyone's universally picked the uh to go back to back, which would be the first time in I can't remember the last team that went back to back national champions. Florida, Florida Gators, two thousand seven. Yeah, Florida. This was, yeah, okay, so it was a number, uh, obviously a long, uh, quite a while ago, but um, yeah, it, it's and that's the thing about the the, the committee is, and and going into. When you when you go into the conference championship play, you the 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 best way to leave no doubt is to win. Yeah. When you weigh in, get the automatic yeah. bid, and then you can just you can sit around and just wait for where you're going, but you know you're in, and that's the mm -hmm. the reassuring thing. I think most teams would love to have and worry about flight plans and opponents yeah. later on. Yeah, I mean, and that's okay. the thing is that when they're doing the bracketology, people looking at the last four in, last four out. The guys who are doing those things, your Joel Linardis, your you know your guys like him, they're basing it on pretty much the conference tournaments to a certain extent going chalk, meaning it's good that conference tournament being won by somebody who's already projected to be in the field. The minute that doesn't happen, it has that domino effect, and that's the thing that people don't. Some people don't seem to get. We got we we're we're good now. So uh, that being said, let's pick a final four. Uh, let's help with some schlubs bracket because it ain't going to be mine. Anthony, Jay, and then me will be the order. Anthony, start us off. All right. In the East, I got UConn. I, I do think the, the, number, the overall number one seed has been the uh, most complete team in the tournament. I do think they get out of the East. The West, I think Arizona. I think every... Despite the bad loss and the fact that they missed out on one seed, the bracket actually worked out better for them. They don't have to travel far uh, of, the, of the number two seeds. And think about this, they get to pretty much stay out west for the majority of the tournament, uh, depending on how far they go. In the south, uh, south region, I got Houston uh, coming out of 
coming out of um out of the South region. The Midwest, I have uh Purdue winning. But I do have them beating Creighton to get there. I do think Tennessee Ooh. falls early. I do. I, if they, uh, I do think if they don't lose to Texas in round two, Creighton does get them in the Sweet Sixteen. I just think that um, one man shows in and around this time of year, unless you're Kimba Walker, uh, tend to catch up to you because. You give a coach uh, six, seven days of game plan for you. If they don't have, think about the thing about great scores is that you don't have to shut them down. Just make their lives more difficult. Uh, and that's something that I do think will eventually happen to a guy like Connect. And they're going to put the pressure on someone else to to score and try to pick up the, the, the star offensive slack for the volunteers. So I have them falling early, but I do have Purdue. Uh, ultimately coming out of the Midwest region. So my final four is UConn, Arizona, Houston, and Purdue. Okay. Uh, out of the East, like Anthony, I, I have UConn for all the reasons I noted in my my East top half breakdown. They're the most complete team in the tournament, hands down. I agree with you. Um, they have to borrow from Jay Billis. Again, guards who who win in Newton and, and Spencer. They have a game changer defensively in Klingon. They have a perfect floor spacer in Caravan and an X factor and a potentially lottery pick Stefan Castle. They share the ball. They're big East tough. They're physical. And Dan Hurley's one of the best coaches in all of college basketball. Iowa state, I think will be a tough test if that's the regional final. Uh, but I still think the Huskies get to defend their crown in the West. I'm taking UNC for all the reasons I noted in my West top half breakdown, but it has to be the best version of the Tar Heels. They're starting five, led by veterans Davis and Baycott. The only Tar Heels left from that 2021-2022 Final Four team is as good as anyone's in the nation, both offensively and defensively. When they're firing on all cylinders, especially on the defensive side of the ball, this team, this team can steamroll anyone in their way all the way to the Final Four, especially since unlike the previous Final Four team, this one has enough quality reserves to go eight deep. Is this more of a heart pick than a head pick? Maybe the lines are a little blurred, but that doesn't mean I'm wrong. Um, in the South, I'm going with Marquette. Anthony laid out all the pros and cons in his South region bottom half breakdown, but I picked the Golden Eagles as a Final Four team back on our college basketball preview show at the end of November, and they've done nothing during the season to change my mind, with the caveat being Tyler Kolek's health. Head coach Shaka Smart told reporters recently that his star point guard will absolutely play in the NCAA tournament. And if he does, I still this team reach, still see this team reaching the Final Four. In the Midwest, I'm going with Purdue for all the reasons I noted in my Midwest top half breakdown. I think they're on a mission after becoming the second number one seed in history to lose to a 16. They want that taste out of their mouths. Uh, they're starting backcourt of Smith & Lawyer as a year older, and the addition of Jones has given them a different dynamic than they had last season, and it's helped make them arguably the best team in the nation not named UConn. I'm more confident in this iteration of Purdue as a Final Four team than any of the previous early exit Boilermaker teams of the Zach Eady era. So, once again, UConn, UNC, Marquette, Purdue. I'm going to make it three for three for UConn. I, they just have looked so dominant since the beginning of the year. They have no real bad losses. They lost in Kansas really early in the year, and they've also had losses in Seton Hall and Creighton when they were the hunted, but they have a good, a region that's decent. I think their biggest matchup is whoever they face in the Sweet 16, whether it be the firepower of San Diego State or an Auburn team that is coming in tremendously hot. I think that side of the region gives them their biggest problem, and I would not be surprised to see a Washington State-type team hmm. or maybe just an Illinois being the team that they beat to get to the Final Four, but I do think UConn does get there. In the West, I had a lot of trouble over here. North Carolina looks really good at times, but at times they play like they did versus NC State, or at times they'll play like they did on the road against Georgia Tech. I don't know what version I'm getting from them at all, and I'm not really happy about the prospect of them going to a regional in Los Angeles. However, Arizona doesn't really excite me either. Their bad is bad. <laughs> it's really bad. And the Pac-12 is really not great this season, and they lost twice against their biggest rival, Washington State. They have a great non-conference schedule, but honestly, I can't trust Arizona in March. So I came to the conclusion, go with Bama out of the West region. Yeah, I know they're not the greatest team defensively, but you know what? We live in an era of offense, and I've seen way too many disappointing Alabama runs 
that sometimes when you build up enough in unity, get yourself one big win over North Carolina and find yourself in a regional final against Arizona or Baylor, I think Alabama can do the trick. So I'm going to go with the team You're not that alone. doesn't have a save it anymore in terms to bring themselves over to Phoenix. In the South, I'm also not going chalk. I'll go Kentucky. I like Kentucky. I like the way that they've been that they've made themselves during the year. Sure, they had to set back in the re, in the SEC tournament against Texas A and M, but what you saw in that Tennessee game to end the season is the best version of Kentucky, and I trust Coach Cal to bring that version to their regional in Dallas. I think they can get out of the first weekend. Texas Tech and NC State are good matchups for them, and then. They might have to play ugly against Houston, but guess what? I think they just have enough power to get past the ugly. So yeah. I'm going to go Kentucky. And then I'm going to go Purdue, the same reason why Anthony, uh, why uh, Jay said it, because this team is on a mission. Zach Eady is going to be a, one of the greatest college players that we've ever seen. He's going to be a two-time-in-a-row Wonder winner, something we very rarely see in college basketball. And I like to play Tennessee in the regional final. Let's have the two best players in America this year connected, Edie, in a true battle of who is the best white guy in college basketball oh, playing man. in the regional final <laughs> over Detroit. A white guy showdown in Detroit because those two guys are hard-nosed players. Not necessarily don't, anything don't, wrong Don't at us, folks. Don't, don't, don't come at us about that. <laughs> we need to have the ultimate white guy battle. Wow. Oh. Regional final. So I like that. And honestly, I will say this if uh, we're not going to be doing a Final Four show because I will be on my uh, honeymoon or my anniversary trip to Mexico, I would not be surprised if Purdue won it all. I really like the makeup of this team. And uh, I'm a little scared as a, as a UConn fan, I'm a little scared just because of the expectations and nobody really does go back to back. But that's my Final Four. Again, UConn. Alabama, Kentucky, Purdue. Ooh. Yeah, Purdue, I just, yeah, Purdue, I just I, I do feel like they, they just need to exercise the demons of last season. Uh once they get past that uh mental hurdle, then uh, they're all uh, full speed ahead. We'll they're see what happens. To... Matt Painter. Huh. I think it's all about what Matt Painter can do with those boys late in the year and something I had them before. All yeah. right, for Jay Castle, this is Anthony Straight Line, David Seaver of Middlewitz. First in your hearts, last in your pool. <laughs> YouTube.com slash on the sports lines, Facebook.com slash on the sports lines, and on X at O N T H sports lines. These are the ways, my friends, that you can consume the show live and on demand and read up on some interesting stories, especially as we get towards opening day, which will be. Yeah, uh, Rabbi, I put up a link uh, to a great piece by uh, Brendan Marks and Kyle Tucker of The Athletic looking at 12 teams who have what it takes to cut down the nets in Phoenix on April 8th. Whether you're you're looking to, for some help filling out your bracket or you just want to know which teams to watch when the madness officially tips off on Thursdays, these gents have you covered. Check it out. And if Shoei Otani's agent ever calls you asking for money, don't answer. Uh, we'll talk next week, uh, next Wednesday, <laughs> opening day in Sweet 16 on our next show. See you then. Good night. Good night, everybody. Good night, everyone. Enjoy the madness. Enjoy it all.